to introduce you our next speaker, uh, Professor Chas Bantra uh, from Nuffield Department of Clinical Medicine of University of Oxford. He's also an associate member of the Department of Pharmacology in which he is a professor of translational medicine. So he dealt in, he dealt in his career with several uh, diseases uh, for drug discovery, um, especially Alzheimer's disease, and in early stage of his career, also gastrointestinal diseases. Um, his goal and what he will talk about today is how to make drug discovery more efficient and uh, quicker, eventually. He's a professional speaker in this kind of conference since he um, gave more than 300 lectures, so I'm really looking forward for your talk. Thank you. Well, Alfredo, thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending. Um, what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just share with you some thoughts uh, about how I think we need to completely transform the way we discover new medicines. So I'm interested in drug discovery. I'm interested in trying to find new medicines for patients. So let me just, um, should I just let people settle down first of all? So let me just share with you some statistics. So I, I live in the UK, so in the UK our population is about 70 million. Now, one of the things that we all worry about is cancer. So let me show you some figures in cancer. In the UK, in the next 12 months, 350,000 people will get diagnosed with cancer. That is 1,000 people every day. That's one person every 90 seconds is going to get diagnosed with cancer. Half of us in this room during our lifetime will have a diagnosis of cancer. In the next 12 months, 14 million people across the world will be diagnosed with cancer. This is a massive problem. I worry about dementia. In the UK today, we have 850,000 people with dementia. In 2051, which isn't that far away, that number is predicted to grow to 2 million. So in the UK, we have a, a pretty large city called Birmingham. Now, the population of Birmingham is 1 million. So we will have two of these large cities with dementia. The average cost of looking after one of these patients every year is £32,000. Now, if you do 850,000 people and it costs £32,000, the total cost to the government, to the health service, is £26 billion a year, just for dementia. £26 billion, incidentally, is all the household energy bills in the UK. So all of our household gas, electricity, that equates to 26 billion. And it's 26 billion even though two-thirds of the cost today is borne by the relatives, not by the government and not by the NHS. And next year, 2017, for the first time, we're going to have more patients than we have carers. And we've not discovered a new drug for Alzheimer's since 2002. We desperately need new drugs. And all of us living to the age of 80 plus, one in six of us will have dementia. This is what's coming our way. What, let's just think about what patients want, what patients' relatives want, what their carers want, what their parents want. Before I do that, I'll share with you two anecdotes. So about a year ago, I had a, a mother of a daughter came to see me. Her daughter has this rare 
GI stromal tumour. It's about one in a million, so in the UK there's probably about 60 or 70 individuals with this tumour. And the mother lives in Bath. Bath is about 60 miles away from Oxford. And her daughter stayed in Bath, but the mother came to see me. And her daughter's physician lives in Cambridge, and he also came. So the mother and the physician are sitting in my office, and the mother starts to cry. She starts to cry because she knows that there is no treatment for her daughter, and nobody in the pharmaceutical industry is interested in developing a new drug to treat 60 or 70 patients in the UK. So I said to this mother, <clears throat> how is your daughter doing? She said, my daughter is 22 years old, and they've just removed the whole of her stomach. And I sat there thinking, how on earth does any parent cope with that? You know, I have a 26-year-old daughter, and frankly, she's my life. You know, so how does any parent cope with that? Literally about six months ago, I gave a public lecture. And at the end of this lecture, this mother came up to me. And she said, Professor Bounter, my daughter died with a brain cancer earlier this year. And she said, if you want to study her brain, this is where you can get it from. And she hands me a scrap of paper with her daughter's name on, her date of birth, the day she died, and where her brain was stored. This is how desperate parents and patients and relatives and carers are. What do these patients want? They want novel medicines, they want effective medicines, they want affordable medicines, and they want them quickly. Now, novel is obvious. They want effective medicines. Why do I say effective medicines? Aren't all the medicines that are out there effective? Well, a study that was done a couple of years ago in cancer, they looked at 71 drugs that are available for treating solid tumours. And they looked to see how much increase in survival these drugs provided. These drugs provided an increase in progression-free survival of 2.5 months. They produced an increase in overall survival of 2.1 months. And in that study, they concluded, of the 71 drugs that are on the market, only 30 of them, 3-0, had clinically meaningful efficacy. Less than half the drugs that are out there for solid treat tumours have clinically meaningful efficacy. Patients want affordable drugs. That's obvious. Let me just share with you some figures. Again, this is a study in the UK, published last year in 2015. They looked at how many drugs were available for treating cancers in the UK in the year 2000, and the number was 69. Of those 69 drugs, 50 of them were cytotoxic treatments. The average duration of treatment was 181 days, six months. The average cost of that treatment in 2000 was £3,000. And £3,000 equated to 20% of GDP per capita in the UK in the year 2000. They repeated that analysis in 2014. Now there was a further 63 drugs for treating cancer. The average duration of treatment was now 263 days, so it's gone up from 181 to 263. The average cost of treatment was now £35,000. It's gone up from 3000 to 35000 And 35000 equates to 140% GDP per capita in the UK. Gone up from 20% to 140%. And this trend is continuing. And of course, patients want drugs quickly. Even tomorrow is too late, they want them today. So novel, effective, affordable, and quick. 
The way we're doing drug discovery today, it's incredibly inefficient. It is too costly, it is too risky, and it is too slow. Let me share with you some figures on cost. About three years ago, Forbes did an analysis. They looked at a number of these large pharmaceutical companies. They looked to see how much money they each spent on research and development over a finite period. And then they looked to see how many drugs each of those companies launched and then divided one number by the other and came up with an average cost of a new drug. In that analysis, Forbes concluded for AstraZeneca, the average cost of a new drug was $11.5 billion. $11.5 billion. Amgen, which were the best, even them, their average cost was $3.5 billion. This is unsustainable. We cannot carry on like this. The process is also too risky. Again, a publication last year, they looked to see in the year 2002, there were 529 molecules in development for cancer. So development meaning they were either in phase one studies, so these are the first studies that you do in human volunteers with a new drug. Phase two, which are the first studies that you do in patients with a new drug and phase three of the big registration studies. So there were 529 molecules in development, so in phase one, two or three, for cancer in the year 2002. And in this study, they looked to see what happened to those 529 molecules ten years later, so in 2013. They found that 45 of these molecules had made it to the market. Okay, that's good. 95 were still in development, but 389 were terminated. So we took 389 new molecules into patients and then terminated them. Just imagine how much money we wasted on those 389 molecules. But importantly, how many patients we exposed with those 389 molecules. This game it's too risky. In that same study, they looked to see that if a molecule is in phase one, so this is the first study in human volunteers, what's the probability it will get to the market? And the answer was 7.5%. Less than one in ten molecules that are tested in volunteers make it to the market for cancer. In the same study, they looked if a molecule is in phase three, so these are the late stage registration studies. What's the chance it will get to the market? And the conclusion was 33%. Only one in three molecules that are in phase three makes it to the market. So it's too risky. It's also too slow. So one of my colleagues, Stefan Knapp, who used to uh, work in my group in Oxford and has now just moved to Frankfurt, he published a paper a couple of years ago where he looked to see when did we first come up with an idea that this protein, this target, if I inhibit it, if I modulate it, it's going to work in cancer, and then how long did it take to test that idea in the clinic? The, uh, Stefan's conclusion was it took between six years and 30 years, three zero. This game, this process, it's too costly, it's too risky, and it's too slow. Why? I think there are scientific reasons, but there are also organizational challenges. So let me go through the scientific ones first of all. We frankly do not, do not understand most human diseases. We have very little appreciation of the heterogeneity of human disease. If I had 10 patients here with depression or 10 patients with Alzheimer's, they would all be different. Their ages would be different, their symptoms would be different, the drugs that work in them would be different, etc. Patients are immensely heterogeneous. For many of these diseases, we don't really understand the molecular causes. 
We haven't got a clue what causes depression. That's why we've not really come up with a truly novel treatment for the past three or four decades. So, we don't understand human disease. The second thing is, for many of these diseases, we don't have good biomarkers. So by biomarkers, I mean ways of assessing efficacy in patients. So if you're doing a clinical study in Alzheimer's, you can't say to the patient, oh, is your memory better today than it was last month? Or to a depressed patient, are you less depressed today than you were last week? You need some way of assessing efficacy. And we do not have good biomarkers for many of these diseases. Frankly, also, I think studies in animal models are not predictive of what happens in the clinic. There are many people in biomedicine who work up targets, come up with ideas, and they show efficacy in some sort of animal model. Well, frankly, we will never have an animal model that fully recapitulates schizophrenia in the clinic or Alzheimer's, etc. These animal models do not predict clinical efficacy. There are many drugs out there, we don't even understand how they work. Paracetamol, acetaminophen, we've all taken it. Probably 100 million people across the world today will take uh, paracetamol. We do not know how paracetamol works. So you could argue, if you don't know how existing drugs work, how can you design better ones? Major scientific challenges. There are also organizational challenges, and this is the thing that upsets me the most. In biomedicine, in academia, in biotech, and in pharma, there is massive duplication. There are so many people, so many groups, so many companies, so many institutes working on the same few ideas in parallel, in secret. The reason is everybody reads the same literature, they go to the same conferences, they talk to the same opinion leaders, they start working on the same ideas in their own labs, they spend five, six, seven years coming up with a proprietary molecule, and then when they test it in patients, the failure rate is 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10. Most of our ideas in the lab do not translate into the clinic. They fail. Now, of course, if you've got 20 companies doing exactly the same thing, if one of them fails, the other 19 are going to fail as well. This is a horrendous waste of money. It's a horrendous waste of people's careers. But it's a monumental and tragic waste of patients. Frankly, the way we're doing drug discovery today, we are exposing patients to molecules that other groups already know are destined for failure. Ethically, and morally, this is wrong. What does the industry want? Industry wants innovation. The reason we haven't got more new medicines, it's not because industry hasn't been trying. They have been trying, it's just this process, it's so difficult. So what do they want? They want innovation. We have not had a new antibiotic since 1984. We have not had a new drug for Alzheimer's since 2002. In 2014, 44 drugs were registered by the FDA. 44 new drugs. Of those, only 39% were a completely novel mechanism, novel target. 61% were what we call Me Too's, or new formulations of existing drugs. In the year 2015, there were 51 drugs registered by the FDA, and coincidentally again, only 39% were novel targets. In the year 2000, in the US, 50% of prescriptions were generic drugs. So these are molecules that have gone off patent. In 2015, that figure had gone up to 86%. 86% of drugs prescriptions in the US were generic. In 2014, a large pharmaceutical company called Lilly 
only 7% of their sales were drugs that were launched in the previous decade. 93% were drugs that were launched more than 10 years earlier. And in 2015, if you took the top 13 pharmaceutical companies, for seven of them, their sales figures had fallen compared to the previous year. This industry needs innovation. So what are we doing? I've shared with you what we need. I've shared with you some of the challenges, what industry wants. So what are we doing? So in Oxford, I've decided to do four things, or this is what we've done. So first of all, we've tried to pool resources. So we get a lot of funding from the Wellcome Trust. So the Wellcome Trust has put close to 60 million pounds of funding into my lab. And what we now do is we get a lot of funding from industry. So we're currently getting funding from eight large pharmaceutical companies. So each of these companies has given us more than 5 million euros. So we have more than 40 million euros of private funding. So we pool our resources. We pool our expertise. We pool our infrastructures. We're trying to share this risk. So that's the first thing. The second thing is... I only work on completely novel proteins or novel targets or novel pathways. I only work on proteins that other people are not working on. I'm not interested in working on targets that the industry has been working on for the past 20, 30 years or for targets where there's already 5,000 publications. We're working on completely novel proteins or protein families. We deliberately work on proteins and protein families that people think are intractable, they're undruggable, because I believe our job in academia is to drive innovation. So we work on these new targets, and what we do is we generate reagents, we generate tools. So we purify the human protein, I'm not interested in rodent proteins, we purify the human protein, we build assays for that protein so we can assess potency and selectivity of molecules, we work out the three-dimensional X-ray structure of that protein. We generate small molecule inhibitors for that protein, and we generate antibodies. These reagents are very high quality. They're high quality not because we're smart. They're high quality because we're working with these eight large pharmaceutical companies. So by working on novel proteins and generating these novel reagents, we're trying to drive innovation. The third thing we do, and this is probably what makes us most unique, all of these reagents, which are essentially starting points for drug discovery, we make them freely available. We give them away to anybody in academia, anybody in biotech, and anybody in pharma, because I believe that's the best thing I can do to facilitate science and therefore facilitate drug discovery. Now, as a consequence, you can imagine every academic who comes into my office, they want to collaborate with us. Because they know I've got no secrets, I'll share all of our know-how, all of our expertise, all of our reagents. And that transparency creates a lot of trust, which is great for collaboration, it's great for science, and it's great for drug discovery. So we're now working with more than 300 academic labs across the world, and these labs are taking these novel tools, testing them their assays, publishing. We are crowdsourcing science on these new proteins. And by crowdsourcing science on these new proteins, we're de-risking those proteins. The fourth thing we do is that all of our data, all of our knowledge, all of our reagents, we make it available to the world immediately, even before we've started writing any publication. And the reason we do that is that we're trying to reduce duplication and reduce wastage. So four things. Pool resources, share risk. Work in novel, impossible areas to drive innovation. Make everything freely available to crowdsource science. And release everything immediately to reduce duplication and wastage. Now let me share with you just one one of these inhibitors that we've generated, let me share with you what the impact of that has been. So back in 2008, I decided I was going to work on epigenetics. 
So epigenetics is all about how the environment affects gene transcription. And I believe many of these proteins are going to be important drug targets in cancer, in inflammatory diseases, in neuropsychiatric diseases, etc. So that was why I started working on them. Now within epigenetics in 2008, there's lots of subfamilies of epigenetic proteins. One of them is what we call histone deacetylases. Well, there was already lots of people working on those, so I deliberately chose not to work on those, and we decided to work on all the others. One of the other families that we decided to work on was called bromodomains. The name doesn't really matter. But in 2008, when I said I was going to work on bromodomains, many people said to me, Chaz, you're mad. You'll never generate inhibitors for those proteins because it's pro these are protein-protein interactions. Anyway, we did. We started working with GSK, and we generated an inhibitor for one of these proteins called BRD4. Now, when we got this inhibitor, we then looked in the literature to see, well, what does this protein do? Where can we test this inhibitor? And there was some data that suggested that this protein, BRD4, when it's fused with another protein called NUT, those patients, those individuals, have a very rare cancer called NUT midline carcinoma. Now, the world expert in nut midline carcinoma is a guy named Jay Bradner at Harvard, so we worked with Jay. We gave him this inhibitor. Jay has access to patient cells, so patients with nut midline carcinoma. He could get those cancer cells. He put this inhibitor on top of those cancer cells. He showed it stopped them multiplying, which is good. It also killed the cancer cells, which is good. And when he took these patient-derived cancer cells and put them into a mouse, the cells multiplied, the tumor got bigger and bigger, and when he gave the inhibitor to these mice, he showed that it stopped the tumor growing. That was back in 2010. We published all of that data in Nature in December 2010. Let me just share with you what's happened since. Well, first of all, when we got that data, Jay wanted to take that molecule straight into patients. And the reason he wanted to take it into patients is because he knew that anybody that's diagnosed with nut midline carcinoma, within three to six months, they're dead. There is nothing out there that treats this cancer. Anyway, we published it in December 2010. That molecule, we have now given out to more than 1,000 labs across the world. A thousand labs. GSK couldn't afford to do that. Pfizer couldn't afford to do it. Novartis couldn't. I can because I don't pay the labs anything. They just take the molecule and they test it in their assays. As a consequence of making that molecule available, there are now more than 400 publications on that target with that molecule. Many of these publications are showing this target will work in a whole range of other cancers. It will work in sepsis, in fibrosis, in COPD, in cardiac hypertrophy, and there's even a publication in male contraception. This is crowdsourcing science. But what's also happened is that many of our pharmaceutical partners, they've started their own internal programs on that target to come up with a proprietary molecule. And today, as a consequence of that, I know of at least eight companies that have generated their own molecules, so eight different molecules, and they are testing those in 18 clinical studies. So remember, 2008, everybody said, Chaz, you're mad, you'll never generate inhibitors for these. We generated one in 2010, we shared it with the world, industry started its own programs, we've accelerated science, we've accelerated clinical studies, but on top of that, Jay, our collaborator in Harvard, he also started a biotech in Boston to take that target into the clinic. He managed to get $15 million of VC funding to set up a company called Tensha Therapeutics in 2011. Earlier on this year, Roche, based in Switzerland, they bought Tensha Therapeutics for $540 million. So we, by releasing one molecule, We've enabled academic science, we've enabled industrial science, we've enabled clinical studies, we've even enabled the creation of new companies. That was just one example. 
We've now generated 45 of these inhibitors for different proteins, and they're freely available to anybody who wants to make use of them. So that's what we've done and the impact we've had. Let me share with you what we're now doing. I said earlier I don't like animal models. One of the advantages of sitting in academia is I'm surrounded by clinicians, I have access to patients, I have access to patient material, and so I, what I want to do is I want to take this patient material, patient cells and patient tissues, and I want to put my inhibitors on top of those. I think that is a much better way to come up with new ideas, new targets for drug discovery. So we're now we're doing that. We're also building broader links with patient groups. So we're now working with five different patient groups for chronic common chronic diseases, but also many rare diseases. And uh, they're providing funding for people in my lab, etc. And one of the advantages of working with patient groups, of course, it facilitates access to patient material. We've just got funding from the Alzheimer's Research UK. They gave us £10 million to build a new dementia institute in Oxford. And in that institute, I'm not going to work on amyloid and tau, targets that many academics and the whole of industry have been working on for 32 years. I'm going to work on completely new targets and new pathways, which I think could produce a step change in this area. The government in the UK just gave us £11 million to build what we've called a pre-incubator. Because what's been happening to date is that many of our collaborators, usually in Boston and San Francisco, they've been taking our new reagents and the new biology that our academic network's been generating and setting up new biotechs. And of course the UK government wants to see more of that happening in the UK and we want to do more of it in Oxford. So we're setting up this bioescalator in Oxford. And finally, just recently, we've been given funding from the Brazilian government to set up a group like mine in Brazil. So these are some of the things that we're working on at the moment. But what's my goal? What's my vision? What I want to do is I want to make the first clinical study that we do in patients with a new target I want to make that pre-competitive. I want to make that freely available to the world. I want to do that in the open. And the logic for that is, rather than 20 companies doing the same thing in parallel, in secret, and then nine times out of 10 they all fail, my argument is let's pool our resources, let's do that experiment once, let's do it well, let's identify the nine in 10 that's garbage, and the one in ten that has the potential to be a new drug. That's, where, that's the direction we're going. But of course, you can imagine, it's, it's hard work trying to change this system. So let me sum up. I believe in early discovery, there is too much competition, there is too much secrecy, there is too much duplication, there is too much wastage. I'm trying to bring together lots of clinicians with lots of academics, with lots of pharma companies, with lots of patient organizations, but also with many biotechs and CROs. We're trying to work together to come up with new ideas, new targets for drug discovery, new clinically validated de-risk targets for drug discovery. We're getting a lot of funding to do this from private organizations, charitable organizations, government organizations, but also philanthropy. I think if we come up with these new targets, these new clinically validated de-risk targets, industry can then take those, generate high quality molecules, and take them through the late stage clinical studies and onto the marketplace. This will be good for patients, it'll be good for industry, and it'll be good for society. We're trying to create a new ecosystem for drug discovery. One which I hope will deliver more novel medicines. More novel and effective medicines. More novel effective medicines quickly. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that they will also be more affordable. Thank you very much.
sure we have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned uh, that by highlighting a new target, you generated a wave of more than 400 publications in addition to industry projects. But isn't it the very effect that you try to avoid the duplication and waste of resources? It's a great question. I always get asked this. Um, but at least what we've done is we've reduced duplication at the very early phase. So instead of all of these companies and all of these academic labs trying to generate their own inhibitors, right? What we've done is we've generated all of those tools and all of those reagents, and we've made those freely available. So you're right. I've sh there is still duplication.